Okay, hi everyone. Welcome back to another session with Fresh Dental Shadowing. Um, today we have Dr. Garibet and she's a general dentist. And yeah, take it away whenever you're ready, doctor. All right, thank you for the lovely introduction. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Garibet. Um, it's so nice to meet you. And I'm very, well, meeting you virtually at least. And I'm very excited to be doing this. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And I hope that you will find something beneficial from this presentation. All right, without further ado, let's get started. Um, so who am I? I am an associate general dentist based in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, I work at a practice called Belton Modern Dentistry. And something that's very important about this organization is that, um, or the what a dental service organization is, it's a group of dental practices that fall under one umbrella. So I currently work with the organization called Pacific Dental Services. Maybe you have heard of them. They're very big. Oh, come on. Okay. So my educational background, I got my doctor of dental surgery graduate degree um, from the Herman Ostro School of Dentistry of the University of Southern California. I am, well, I guess not so fresh anymore because we have another class that's about to leave. So I still think I'm pretty fresh in the class of 2020. Um, I also went to undergraduate. I got a BA in biology with minors in chemistry and psychology from the University of Redlands born and raised in Southern California, never left. So this is my first time adventuring outward. And I think you guys are all on the East Coast. So where are you located? Oh, I'm in California too. Oh, you're in California. Oh, okay. So we were just doing it based on Eastern time. Okay. Anyway, so uh, my journey into dentistry, I guess it sprung at a young age indirectly. So my dad worked as the chief executive officer in a dental lab when I was growing up and I didn't even realize it, but I was playing with wax ups before I even knew it. So that was something that we would do for fun when I went with my dad to work sometimes. And, uh, I always knew I wanted to be a health professional. I really enjoyed the sciences. Um, and I just loved the, aspect of being able to help people. That was just something I've always been passionate about. I've always loved community service and giving back to my community. So being a health professional is a great way to do that. So I never really thought of doing any other career. Now there are many ways to be a health professional. So of course, I, my first instinct was to become a medical doctor. But one of my cousins in Lebanon, she was in dental school at the time that I was visiting her back in 2010. And she told me I, that she knew I wanted to be a doctor, but she asked me if I had ever looked into dentistry. And to be honest, I was literally the worst patient growing up. I <laughs> was terrified of the dentist. So obviously becoming a dentist never crossed my mind, but I gave it some thought and I had an open mind. And I said, sure, I'll go with you to dental school. So she took me in with her one day and I fell in love with it and I never looked back. So how to become a dentist? What does it take? There are of course some exceptions to this um, depending on where you go or where you want to go, but this is just the general picture or at least how it was back when I applied back in 2015. Yeah, 2015. So the undergraduate degree um, is obviously required um, and there are some required and recommended prerequisite courses. Keep in mind that you need several letters of recommendation. I believe the number is four, two from a science professor, uh, two from professors in the sciences and two from elsewhere, I think is the recommended format of the letters of recommendation. But there's also a way to get a committee letter. I took the several letters of recommendation route. Um, you do not have to be a science major to go to dental school, fun fact, um, just as long as you take the required courses. So my husband, for example, he is an oral surgery resident right now. He was actually an art history major in college. So that was very interesting and intriguing to schools. And in fact, when he went for his oral surgery interview, they loved that. So the more outside the box you can get, the better. It is a little bit more of a demanding course load but I do recommend thinking a little bit outside the box to make yourself stand out. 
And of course you get four years of dental school to become a dentist. Of course, there is an exception. The University of the Pacific does do a three-year program, um, but most programs on average will be four years of dental school. And for specialty, there's even more school on top of it. Um, I'm not sure what age group I'm talking to here, but a lot of people don't realize um, when you're younger before you get to um, really getting serious about pre-dent, um, most people don't realize that specialty is an additional uh, few years on top of it. So it can range from two to six years in addition. <laughs> yeah, so six years in addition, that's what my husband is going through right now and it's a long time. So what is my advice for college? Definitely, if you're considering becoming a pre-dent, get as much exposure to the field as you can. I'm sure you've heard this a thousand times, but it truly is the best way to prepare. And I would shadow several different general dentists if your time and schedule allows, because each general dentist has a different experience, whether even if they went to different dental schools, that's pretty obvious that they may know different things and may have different valuable lessons to teach you. But even if you went to the same dental school, no one dentist thinks the same way or treat them plans the same way or does a procedure the same way. So you should definitely shadow as many people as you can to get as much exposure. And that will surely help you with your future in dentistry. Now, one of the newer pieces of advice or one of the things that I didn't do that I really wish I had done was consider becoming a dental assistant or a lab technician. Uh, just for comparison's sake, I think that being a dental assistant before school is going to make you a much better dentist in the future because you're going to become very familiar with the workflow of how a practice works. Of course, you don't have to do this, but I think that it is literally the best way to get your shadowing hours and you get paid at the same time. I just think it's really wonderful and more pre-dents should do it. We have several pre-dents in my practice that are, um, sorry, I just got a call. We have several pre-dents in my practice that are actually dental assistants right now. And I can tell you that they are getting so much exposure. They get to ask me questions during procedures. I show them what cavity or caries feels like, and I give them a really big, good breakdown of what's going on. So I'm only one. I can only, I can imagine that there are thousands of other dentists out there that would be willing to give you that same opportunity. So definitely recommend it. Now, a lab technician is the person that is fabricating the crowns and dentures or what have you, the apparatuses for dentistry for us. Now, it's not as clinical based, but if you want to work on getting your hand skills in shape, which I should have done because I definitely had to work very hard for my hand skills, this is a great opportunity for you to consider because not only are you going to get more hand skills and learn the principles of things that behind the scenes, that behind the scenes knowledge will give you the best edge to know how to make your clinical experience much better. And what I mean by that is, you know, how crowns are fabricated. So you know what preparation analysis to do. So you know the struggles of the lab. So your results are going to become much better. When your margin isn't clear, the lab technician is not going to be able to seal that margin on a crown. This is just an example. So these are the struggles that you can avoid future in your career, making your time and your job much more efficient. And the good, even better thing about this for a dental assistant, you don't even need training really if you have, depending on the state, of course, but if you have a dentist that is willing to take you in with no experience, they can train you legally in a lot of states. I know that in Missouri, you don't have to have a dental assistant license to, uh, to assist. Um, there are also really short programs to get trained on this. So you can get trained in a few months at a community college to become a dental assistant or a lab technician. Also just a few short months and a little bit of investment of your money and you're going to assist your future so much. So I would definitely consider that have a lot of extracurriculars. Um, some of my tips for this are that dental students are very eager to get pre involved with or their community service projects. So I would definitely reach out to students, uh, dental students to see if they can host you at the next community service event that's out there. Now I know that COVID is kind of inhibiting both shadowing and community service opportunities, 
but I don't think it ever hurts to ask because I know that I was a very eager dental student and I was very happy to get more pre dents involved with our community service. So definitely consider reaching out to dental students online, or if you know anybody, don't be shy. We really appreciate it. And we would love to have you involved. And if you don't know how to start reaching out to dental students, you can of course reach out to me. I will get you in touch with a USC dental student right now. Granted, I may not be as close to the earlier dental students, but I do like to keep in touch and I will definitely get you in contact with someone that can help you. So don't volunteer. This is another piece of my advice in just dental experiences. Schools do like to see a well-rounded applicant. That kind of circles back to that piece of advice that I offered with the considering a major outside of the sciences. Uh, the reason is because everybody will want to get involved. Everybody's doing hundreds of hours of shadowing. Everybody is doing this. Everybody's doing community service. How are you going to set yourself apart from the thousands and thousands of applicants if you're just doing what everybody else is doing? Uh, so something that really stood out about my application was I was very involved with pageantry and not very many dental school or dental student applicants are involved with pageantry and pageantry not only gave me a good communication edge so i was performing above average in interviews but i was also really involved with community service of all sorts i volunteered at i was a camp counselor for uh, our own family camp which is a camp that is for families with a member affected by Down syndrome. So I worked with special needs patients a lot or special needs children a lot. And patients, of course, my mind is just always about dentistry. Um, I've also did volunteering with Operation Santa Claus where I helped students that were under, or little um, middle school students who were underserved and couldn't afford a new outfit for school. Um, we helped them pick clothes out for that. And that was all donation based um, at, was it Kmart or Kohl's? One of those stores. So we got to volunteer with that. I fed the homeless. I put together food packages. I've done like all kinds of different volunteer opportunities. So if you want some creative ideas or something that you're passionate about, even animal shelters, I literally volunteered at an animal shelter weekly during college. Anything that you're passionate about, or if you need a um, spark of inspiration to get involved with your community, let me know. I have plenty of ideas and I will definitely help you out. So the DAT study strategies, um, I'm not sure how relevant this still is. I took my DAT six, oh my God, six years ago for the second time. The first time I took it seven years ago. So this might be very different now, but from what I understand, this is still pretty up to date. DAT uh, the has a DAT bootcamp has a program, a 10 week study schedule that I followed and that was superior. I did also try Kaplan's DAT course, but that did not work for me because if you haven't taken a Kaplan course before, even though you're having a instructor lecture you on what you need to prepare, there's a lot of reading on the side. And I definitely did not do any of that reading. So if you're somebody that is usually better with like a lecture type environment. I would not consider Kaplan. I didn't think it was useful for me. I scored very poorly after preparing with Kaplan because there was so much self-studying on the side. I would just rather cut out that lecture element and just do all of the self-studying on my own. And DAT bootcamp is very efficient at that. And if you just follow RE study schedule for 10 weeks, it is so doable and you will succeed. I brought up my perceptual ability score by like six points. So definitely consider it. So what is life like as a dental student? Again, it is very dependent upon where you go. So a student at University of Southern California is going to have a very different experience than a student at UCLA, even though we're just a few miles away from each other. Um, so at USC, this was my experience, and I understand that things are slightly changing in the clinical part, but that's so down the road, you don't even have to think about that. Um, but anyway, at USC, you have two years of pre-clinic where you learn the fundamentals of tooth preparation, dentistry, um, you gain your hand skills and you learn your biomedical sciences, which is just like the anatomy, some, um, physiology, stuff like that. 
we used problem-based learning to learn the biomedical sciences, which is very different from traditional lecture. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of PBL before, but it is very non-traditional. So for biomedical sciences, like physiology, learning how the kidney works or how the lungs work and how your organs function together, um, we didn't have a teacher lecturing us, which is just kind of strange because that is what you're used to. Instead, you would be given a case where the, they give you a case about a patient stating that they have something wrong with them. For instance, the one that's coming to my mind right now is uh, this patient has mouth sores and they're very painful and she has these conditions. Uh, she also has a fever, stuff like that. And you're just like, whoa. And you're supposed to make, you're supposed to break down the facts. Okay, so she has mouth sores, fever, and other symptoms. And then, so those are the facts of the case. Then you make ideas about why, how those facts can be related. So she is having cold sores or she's having sores in her mouth and fever due to an autoimmune condition. You don't have to be correct, but you're just formulating ideas as to why these things could be happening. And then you make a learning need based on those ideas. So I want to research um, autoimmune conditions of the oral cavity. That would be your learning need. So that is how you're learning all of your biomedical sciences for, to prepare for your board exams. So keep that in mind if you want to look at going into USC, because not a lot of programs offer this type of learning. And if you feel that you are good in study groups and you are an independent learner at the same time, this is very good. I think that problem-based learning made me such a good independent learner and researcher because we had to research everything. If we needed to know it for an exam, there was no real guideline. You had to be able to research it and be the expert in that. So I think that it is very good, especially now because I have become so efficient at researching information and breaking down and throwing away all of the stuff, all the fluff and getting to what I need to. So you will continue to do research for the rest of your career as a dentist, by the way. Okay. So that is the first two years of dental school. Then you have two years of clinic where you practice procedures on your patients. You're no longer working on a mannequin and it is quite honestly, some of the most stressful times, but also the best of times because you're finally, you finally made it. You're doing what you have dreamt of for so long. So you have a series of requirements that you need to complete at the clinic. And, um, so for instance, you have a certain number of crowns. You need to do a certain number of fillings. You need to do, you have to do a certain number of dentures, um, to become competent in these procedures to practice as a dentist. Uh, you also have your rotations mixed in. So for instance, at USC, they have several rotations where you work on kids, several rotations where you work on um, skid row. You, there's several, I don't want to go through all of them, but you have rotations mixed into that. And the question I commonly get as um, pre dents always ask me are, do you have a life as a dentist or as a dental student? And I say, always respond, yes, you can have a life but you definitely have to be able to manage your time well. So while I was in my third year of dental school, I um, got back into my pageantry career for the last time. And I really just wanted so badly to compete at Miss International. So I competed at Miss California International, won the title, and then I went to a week of nationals and got first runner up. So that was kind of stressful for a while, preparing for a pageant and being in school, but you can definitely do it if you just manage your time well. So general dentistry, what is general dentistry? I mean, most people have met a, a general dentist, or at least I hope you have at this stage in your life. Um, but I always like to say it is what you make of it. You can do anything within the scope of dentistry from surgical extractions, sedations, implants, crowns, cleanings, you name it. If you love it, you can do it. There is no limit. Each, and that makes your job really exciting. Truly, each day is very different and there is lots of versatility to this job. So one of the main reasons I love being a general dentist is because I get to choose what I want to do. I'm not restricted to any one procedure. I can do a root canal and an implant in the same day. And it's amazing. So definitely if you want variety and you don't want to ever be bored, consider general dentistry. So what's a typical day for me like? It really depends on where you're located and how your office is structured. So for me, 
uh, well, my second point is that patient demographics also play a huge day or a huge role in how your day looks. And that just means your patient population is definitely going to change things. So in my area in Belton, Missouri, um, it's kind of, I wouldn't say rural, it's a suburb of South Kansas city. A lot of people though, from farmlands come to Belton because it's like the closest thing that they can get to in terms of like a city. So I'm catering to a certain type of demographic for sure. They're not as affluent as people maybe in Overland Park, Kansas, where that's very similar to like Beverly Hills, California, where they're wanting more aesthetic procedures and they don't have gum disease or lots of cavities. They're more so doing things for an aesthetic purpose. So in my office, this is how things are structured. We have a three column schedule. And that just means that we're able to fit patients into three different operatories and stagger them. So one of my columns is typically meant for new patients. One column is meant for production. And the last column is meant for continuing care exams. Production includes crowns, root canals, fillings, scaling, and root planning, which is just a fancy word for deep cleanings, extractions, honestly, pretty much anything, restoring implants, the list goes on. And yes, as a general dentist, you will see the children as well. So what brings patients in to see us? As a general dentist, I see a wide, unlimited range of chief concerns. I work in a place that generally provides care to a blue collar, like I mentioned. So these are people that are working in industrial type environments in factories or on farms. Um, so that makes life very exciting because you are dealing with a lot of um, the dental IQ may not be as high as somebody in um, a more affluent area. Um, so insurances and finances play a major role in their treatment. They're not going to pay any cash for treatment. So we are not fee for service. Um, Another thing that is very important to keep in mind is that smoking here is very common. So they have major periodontal and restorative needs. So I get a lot of gum disease and bombed out teeth. So what procedures do you commonly perform? It really depends on your comfort level. I would say that I'm a pretty, not aggressive, aggressive isn't the right word, but I'm pretty adventurous. That's the word I go for. I love doing a lot of different procedures. So some dentists will not touch a molar root canal, but I am someone that's going to keep trying it. A lot of dentists won't touch surgical extractions. I am trying to push my territory a little bit. So definitely it depends on your comfort level. You are the quarterback for your patient's care, which means that you definitely have to keep after your patients. So you are the one that's going to be telling them what to do and where to go. So let's say that your patient needs oral surgery and needs to see a periodontal specialist. You need to collaborate with the specialist to make sure your patient is getting the care that they deserve. The world of dentistry is your oyster. It really just depends on what you feel comfortable doing. Keep in mind though, this is very important. If you decide to do a procedure reserved for a specialist, like extracting wisdom teeth, that is something I will not touch. <laughs> and it's imperative that you do it to the level of a specialist and operate to the standard of care. And what that basically means is that if you are going to um, extract wisdom teeth, for example, make sure that you are doing it just as an oral surgeon who went to residency did it. Because if you, if something goes wrong, you are responsible for that patient. And the, if you go to court, they will be asking if you operated to the standard of care. And it is very hard to defend that. So just keep that in mind. Don't go too crazy. There's a reason that the specialists are there, but if you want to try multiple things, try them. So what diagnostic tests and instruments are used? Since we are considered the primary doctor for the patient's care, we must be able to diagnose properly and refer when needed. So that comes back to operating to the standard of care. Um, thus, we are proficient in using most, if not all diagnostic tests such as x-rays, um, probing, knowing how to endo test and when to endo test, which is just testing for a root canal or stuff like that. I won't bore you with the details. <laughs> so what are some modern technology that um, dentists use? So one of my favorite parts of being a dentist is that the field is constantly changing. Um, there's a reason why we have continuing education requirements because 
technology is ever changing and how it assists dentists is always changing. And it is so cool to be in a field where I can constantly learn and adapt. Like I said, it is truly not a boring field at all. So what is new in the particular company that I work for or what technology do we implement? After all, I do work in a practice that's called Belton Modern Dentistry. So what do we use? Um, we use Sarah CatCam. If you're not familiar with that, you might've heard of the term same day crown. It's basically a computer that eliminates the need for an impression and sending the impression slash model to the lab to fabricate the crown for you. This computer allows you to scan a model digitally, design the crown yourself and mill it out. And you have a crown in just a couple of hours. And it's really fascinating. So I really love being able to use this technology and a lot of dental schools will teach you this. So that's a good question to ask your dental schools. Or do you have the ability to use CAD CAM? It doesn't have to be CEREC, but there are multiple CAD CAM systems out there. So if you're interested in being a general dentist and want to learn how to do that, maybe consider going to a school that does that. USC has requirements where you have to work with the CEREC. So that was pretty interesting to me. There's also CBCT radiographs, which is the image that you're seeing in the bottom right corner. And this basically allows you to see the skeletal structures in three different planes. Um, and that is very useful in dentistry. I cannot tell you how many times I wished I had a CBCT. The reason being, it can tell you where positions of roots are or nerves are for the root canal system. If you're doing a root canal, because root canals are never that easy. You're basically going in blind. So having this element of technology is so helpful to know where hidden nerve canals may be. It also can help you in placing your implants in the precise position in between bone, because if you don't do that, you can have a poor prognosis or outcome of the implant. So it, the list goes on. CBCT radiographs are extremely helpful for diagnosing problems and for making your time efficient. There is other modern technology being used out there. There's oral, well, we didn't, I didn't mention this in the company that I work for, but there's something to help uh, detect oral cancer called the Velscope. There's lasers to drill out cavities, which just blows my mind. So you don't even have to anesthetize the patient anymore. There's lasers out there that can literally just beep a cavity out and you don't have to use the drill anymore. And there's also digital smile design, which is very similar to you know, CEREC in a way, uh, you use a scanner to help make a model on a computer. And then you're able to show the patient aesthetically what their smile is going to look like. And then you go from there. So dentistry in practice, um, here's a case that I had several months ago, a young female in her twenties presents for an emergency evaluation with these exact words. I have radiating pain in my lower right jaw that wakes me up in the middle of the night. I think it's from my broken tooth. I also have receding gums in my lower front teeth that cause me pain. I also have another cavity in my upper right. Basically just a lot is happening. So this was literally in response to me asking, why don't you tell me about yourself and why you're here? So she was kind of starting all over the place. So she started for an emergency evaluation. Usually I would ask uh, how you would handle this, but I don't know if I want to put you on the spot for that. Um, I got a couple of you. Do you guys want to try? I'll go back to the other slide. I'm curious to see what you would say. Or not. Okay. <laughs> we'll move on then. Um, so how I would do it. So the patient, like I mentioned, I kind of gave you a clue. She told you that there were several things going on. So even though she's here for an emergency evaluation, it is clear that she wants to have multiple things addressed. So I would bring it up to her, letting her know that at our particular office, we do not charge additional for x-rays to get a full picture of what's going on. Um, and they usually really appreciate that. And I always tell them, okay, it's only gonna take about 15 minutes additional, but we should get all of this addressed since you brought up multiple things. And they always usually appreciate that. It just as long as you're giving them the choice. Don't force it on them but allow them to make that decision themselves. So once they make that decision, in this case, she said, I would like a full exam. You tell your assistant to take a full series of x-rays. Then you conduct your full exam, diagnose all that you see in the x-rays, take your gum pocket depth readings, which is assessing the level of gum disease if present. And then you do an oral cancer screening. 
do not get distracted. Oftentimes patients have a lot more going on than what they're telling you about, but always focus on what they want you to look at. Do not get carried away. You know, in this picture on the lower left side. So this isn't exactly accurate because this is the upper left side, but let's pretend that, you know, this was, because this is essentially what it looked like when she came into me. So we see that she's got a cavity here. She's got a, a spicula calculus here. She's got another cavity starting here, but, and then she has a filling here. And then you're like, oh my gosh, I have so much going on. What am I going to tell her? She has maybe another cavity underneath here and here. And then she's got all this happening. Stop right there. <laughs> you want to address what brought her in. She's in pain, right? It's likely from the big cavity that's here. So focus on the first thing that she talked about. Okay. So we got that handled. So we're probably going to need a root canal and crown here because it's so close to the nerve. This is the nerve. This is the enamel. This is the dentin. That's the cavity. So it's pretty close to the nerve and x-rays. Um, I always use this analogy, you know, how in the car mirror, it says that things are often closer than they appear. Same with cavities. So they are often closer to the nerve than they appear to be. So this, even though it doesn't look like it's touching the nerve, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's going to expose the nerve. And if it doesn't expose the nerve, it's going to cause irritation. <laughs> so you should consider treatment planning a root canal just in case, because you don't want to have to let the patient know after the fact, if you just treatment plan a filling for this, <laughs> it's really uncomfortable to have to tell them to pay more money than less money. <laughs> so I err on the side of caution with that. So I would say this, this probably needs a root canal and crown. Um, and of course you're going to note in your chart. Okay. There is a cavity here. Watch that. There's a cavity here that needs a filling, but focus on talking about this one for now addressing her main concern. She also brought up that she has recession in her lower front teeth, which means the gums are kind of moving downward and she's starting to see the root structure of her teeth and she didn't know why. So this is what, this is a little bit extreme. This is not what her x-ray looked like, but I'm sure you guys can tell that this is the bone. This is the tooth and the bone should not be this low. So the bone should be more around here. You can kind of see it up here. So do you see where the enamel meets the root structure here and how the bone is right up next to that? This is where the enamel meets the root structure here and the bone is way down here. So this bone is not supporting this tooth very well, meaning that she has, this person has pretty severe gum disease in that area. And what causes gum disease? It's the accumulation of bacteria in the gums. And usually, and that's in the form of tartar. It doesn't always have to be, but this is not what a normal lower anterior tooth looks like. All of this is tartar or calculus. And that's what's causing the gums to, and the bone to recede away. And that's what happened to her. She had a wall of calculus here because this area is very hard for patients to keep clean. So that's what's causing that. So you can tell her that's what's going on and what you recommend to do in that case, which would be a scaling and replaning or a deep cleaning where you numb them up and you remove that bacteria from beneath the gums. And that's addressing her other concern that she brought up. And then she also brought up another cavity. Um, so you might want to tell her that you see it and there is a cavity starting, but don't overwhelm them all at once. Focus on um, two main things because it starts to get overwhelming in terms of how they're going to afford this and time, how they're going to find the time to do this. So focus on here and focus on here. And then you can maybe think of another thing that she brought up, but that's it. I wouldn't go beyond that and then start to address it as she starts to come along for her continuing care. So again, discuss what you have found with her. Um, starting with what brought her in. So <laughs> I always still get carried away. Like I said, I'm still new and dentistry is always a practice. So you always are going to continue to get better at your skills, but um, it'll always be a work in progress. So start with what brought her in. I see that you have a lower um, tooth that's cracked, like you told me, and I definitely see it on the x-ray. I have a way that we can fix it. If it's fixable, of course, let her know that it's fixable so that she can rest assured. Um, and some patients don't want it fixed. Let them ask them in the beginning, like, 
okay, if you had my job, what would you like to have done for this tooth? Well, doc, you know, I'd really like to save that tooth if I can, because I only have so many back teeth left. Okay. So you already know that this patient wants to save the tooth. So give them that option too. Um, if they are just like, no, I want to pull it and the tooth is savable, definitely try to give them at least a bit of advice and let them know that the tooth is savable, but you can't push them either way because then they're just going to start thinking that you're trying to make money off of them. And that's never a good look. So if they're, let them be the dentist in a way, I always let them guide me in what I want to do with them. So you bring in with what concerns her the most, which is the broken tooth. And then you talk about what concerns you the most. And in that case, definitely that gum disease and that wall of tartar concerned me the most. Granted, she was also concerned about it, but that was definitely something that I would like to address before addressing another cavity because gum disease is the number one cause of tooth loss. And she was very young. She's in her 20s. She shouldn't have that much tartar building up and causing that much recession. So I would address that with the scaling and root planning and also getting her a specialist referral to help restore the gums because gums don't go grow back to where they once were. So hopefully we can do something about that. Um, so as I kind of mentioned before, if the patient has a lot going on, try not to overwhelm them. Try putting yourself in their shoes. If someone was trying to come in and tell you, you need this, 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 this on every tooth, you, you would definitely get overwhelmed. I remember the one time I went to the dentist after a long time of not going to the dentist. And she told me I had five cavities that alone overwhelmed me. And they all could be treated with fillings, which is not a complicated treatment plan. But I was just like, oh my God, I have five cavities. Like I thought I was taking care of my teeth. I'm a pre-dent student for God's sakes. Like why am I having cavities? And that was overwhelming to me. <laughs> so I can only imagine how a patient who doesn't really know much about dentistry would feel if you give them all this treatment. So definitely try not to overwhelm them. Of course, for your own knowledge, diagnose what you see. So you don't miss it in the future or especially legally, you don't want to seem like you've missed disease, but they don't have to know everything. You can let them know that they do have other things, but you're going to start in steps and go incrementally. And that usually most patients appreciate that. So if for some reason they have other teeth that are really bothering them on like the same side, or they're like, Oh yeah, this tooth and this tooth, then you can start to talk about multiple things. But when you start getting carried away with all these things, I would just let it go and focus on one thing after the other. Um, and then I would start treatment if that is what they're asking for and they're financially able. And in this case, she, she was in pain. So she wanted everything to, she wanted everything to happen to bring her out of pain. So the diagnosis was irreversible pulpitis with no apical pathology, which basically means the nerve um, is infected to the point where it's not going to recover. So we have to do a root canal and remove the nerve. And no apical pathology, meaning there is no infection. It didn't reach all the way down to the apex to cause an infection in the bone yet. And when you see an infection in the bone, it starts to look very see-through and you wouldn't see this um, white line. I don't have a picture of that, but so um, basically when you have an infection that starts here, the cavity starts, starts, spreads to the nerve and it starts to continue down the nerve and keeps going, keeps going, bacteria keeps going. And then it starts to eat out the bone. It's just going to keep going unless you remove the infection. So in this case, she was lucky. It only reached probably into her nerve. We don't know where in her nerve, but it was very infected. I remember when it opened up, it was bleeding and it was crazy. So she was definitely had an infection going on in the nerve somewhere. Um, so treatment options that you give the patient, you can do a root canal and an indirect restoration, which is a fancy word for a crown and layer on lay. In this case, it's a very controversial thing, whether or not you should always crown root canals. I personally prefer to always crown root canals because, um, root canals teeth without that nerve there, they're not as strong. So they have much more prone to fracture and then you're just automatically stuck with taking out the tooth. So if you're already doing this option, you want to give the patient a much less chance of fracture. So I would just consider crowning it, but of course that is up for debate. <laughs> um, so that's one option. You can extract the tooth um, and you could do nothing. So you always have to give the patient the option to do nothing. And that always breaks my heart, but you know, the person's gonna do what they are able to do. Um, so in this case, she wanted to keep her tooth, thank goodness. And she selected the root canal and same day crown option. So this was actually her root canal that I did. Um, pretty nice if I do say so myself. So I was pretty proud of that. And um, 
this is basically what the CEREC technology looks like. This is obviously not the same tooth, but um, so this is what an inlay looks like. And this is, oh, I can't really zoom in, but that would be like what a crown looks like. I'm not sure if you guys have seen what a crown preparation looks like, but you know, when you like lick the side of an ice cream cone and it starts to make like this weird shape like this, like a little mushroom shape and you lick the side of the ice cream cone and you keep going. That's what a crown prep looks like. So you have some tooth around the side of it and you put a cap on top of it and that helps to protect the tooth from fracture because porcelain is very strong. Um, in this case, uh, this is how you do it. So you prepare the tooth, you drill it down, make it prepared to have enough material to protect it. You scan it into the computer. So this is what the 3D model looks like that I was talking about. And then you design the crown by telling the computer where the tooth structure and the crown will meet. That's what you call a margin. So this is where the margin is here. This is where the margin is here. You see that? And the margin is um, a combination of preparing the tooth for the material and also um, eliminating the bacteria or cavity that's there. And then you tell the computer, okay, this is where my margin is. And in another picture that I had back here, you saw this is what the crown will design will look like. So I tell the computer, okay, I like this. I can modify it here if I don't like something. And then um, you tell the computer to print it out. And once it's printed out, depending on the type of crown you do, it could be tooth colored. It's, it depends on the material. Um, and you can just cement it then. Or in this particular case, um, they, this material is called Emax, which is a lithium disilicate or glass material. And you put it into an oven to bake it, to make it tooth colored. So right now it's purple. And once you put it in an oven for 15 minutes at like 450 degrees Fahrenheit or something crazy like that, or Celsius, I can't even remember. It's very hot and it converts um, this to a tooth color and it makes it stronger. Um, so that's a case that I did that was pretty interesting and that's pretty routine. We do that multiple times a week, if not multiple times a day. So that's what in my practice, that's what a normal day looks like. Um, I also mentioned that I love doing community service. So I thought I'd bring up some community service trips that I did in dental school. So I was on student leadership for IUTA International, which is partnered with Rotary International. I'm not sure if any of you are involved with Rotaract or if you've heard of Rotary International. You've probably seen the little wheel um, on your city sign, or you've probably walked by a clock that has that wheel. That is what Rotary is. There's millions of members worldwide. And we partner up with that organization through USC and we do international service trips along with local clinics all around Southern California um, and where we provide free dental care to people who do not have access to it. We do cleanings, fillings, extractions, you name it. The only thing we can't really do are root canals and crowns because those typically require follow-up and you do not want to commit to a patient that you may not be seeing again. So in my journey with uh, Rose, uh, and with Ayuda International, I went to Rosarito, Mexico three times. I went to Phuket, um, my third year of dental school or starting my third year. And that was actually my first time working on a patient ever. That was my first time ever. And, um, that was the first time I ever drilled on a tooth. Crazy. Absolutely wild. Um, and then I went to Panama city, Panama, which is here, this little girl. I thought she hated me. Cause I think I pulled out one of her baby teeth. <laughs> She definitely wasn't very happy with me, but after the procedure, I made sure to let her know that I was so proud of her and she gave me a really big hug and it was just one of the most touching things ever. Um, so here are more pictures from, this is in Thailand, me as Miss California International working in Panama. This is also in Thailand. Um, so if you go to dental school and you have the ability to do some sort of international trip, highly recommend doing it. It was, it's still one of the best experiences that I've ever had in my life. Like nothing will ever compare to that. In conclusion, advice to our future dentists of the world. This is a quote that I found very intriguing and I think it is very important. So let's read it together. Like success, failure is many things to many people. With a positive mental attitude, failure is a learning experience, a rung on the ladder and a plateau at which to get your thoughts in order to prepare to try again. I think this is very important. As a dentist, you have to be resilient. You are going to fail. 100%.
You could be the best dentist in the whole world, but you are still not going to have every day be perfect. You will mess somebody's tooth up, guaranteed. You will make it so that you can't fix it. You're going to let some people down. I've let people down in dental school. I've let people down in private practice. It happens. I'm not the only one that's done it. And failure is inevitable, inevitable, but it's how you embrace that failure. That's going to make you truly great and successful. So if you're in a place right now and you may not be doing as well in your chemistry class, you may not have, um, you're comparing yourself to your colleagues or your, your co-students and you're thinking, I'm not as good as them. I failed my chemistry test. So what? Move on. You're going to be wonderful one day and you're going to be successful. And failure is just part of being successful. I have definitely botched some people's teeth trying to do some things because I want to invest this time into becoming the best version of myself as a dentist. And the more things you fail, it just means that you're doing more of it and you have to embrace it and you have to be willing to to fail in order to succeed and you will all be so successful. And I cannot wait to see how you all transform our profession. I'm so excited for the future with leaders like you guys, you are all embracing such adversity right now um, by talking to dentists, trying to find opportunities that may not be there right now, but I'm so proud of you. Keep going. And I, I'm just so impressed with the level and the caliber of our students. And I cannot wait to see the future of our profession in your hands in your more than capable hands. Are there any questions for me? All right. Thank you, Dr. Garibet. That was an awesome presentation and um, really insightful. Yeah. Uh, so I think we can start with our questions now from the YouTube live chat as well as the Instagram, if that's okay with you. Of course. Okay. Um, so the first question was, why did you decide to work in um, like Missouri and what factors do you think go into deciding where to practice as a dentist after you graduate dental school? That's a really good question. So um, I initially didn't really think to move to Missouri. If you had asked me before Michael matched, I would have been like, nope, <laughs> I was never going to leave Southern California. Um, I definitely loved Southern California, but I, I am an open-minded person. Don't get me wrong. Um, but Michael, he wanted to be an oral surgeon and he matched in Kansas city. So I didn't really have a choice. I knew he was the one for me. We weren't married at the time. We were actually only dating for a year. So we did three years of long distance. Um, and I knew that he was the one for me. So I knew that I would be here eventually. And, um, you know, he brought me here and I would say that it is the biggest blessing in disguise because being in Southern California, it is tough. There are a lot of dentists granted. There's a lot of people, but there are a lot of dentists and a lot of competition out there. Everybody wants to be that cosmetic dentist in Beverly Hills. What's going to set you apart from them? And it's hard. It's stressful. I mean, even here it's stressful and there's always going to be competition everywhere, but in Southern California, it's just that much tougher. So I definitely think it's a blessing in disguise as a new dentist to be in a place where I don't really have to worry as much about my neighbors. Of course, there's always going to be that competition, but I love being here and you know, you can make pretty good money being out here in comparison and the money takes you a lot farther even though I'm technically getting paid the same amount of money I would have been getting paid in California, the dollar takes you a lot farther here. So you might be ha having a happier lifestyle if you consider going somewhere that is not as populated like New York or California. And honestly, Kansas City is pretty cool. If you have questions about Kansas City, I love it here. People are nice and it is a beautiful city. It is a hidden gem in the Midwest. Trust me. If you have any questions and you want to consider going somewhere else, if you are at that stage, contact me. I am happy to help you figure out a good place for you. And if that happens to be Kansas City, I'd love to have you as my assistant. Just saying. <laughs> okay, 
thank you. And then um, what are your thoughts on private practice versus corporate dentistry and like kind of the pros and cons of each? That's a great question also. Wow. Okay. So um, I looked into both options. Um, I had a private practice here that I wanted to work for. And I also looked into corporate. Now, <laughs> if you had asked me while I was in dental school, I was not really for either option. I was also thinking about being a specialist. I mean, I was all over the map in dental school and that's how you should be. You should be open-minded. Um, the pros of working in a corporate dental office, I really hate calling it corporate because that makes it sound like we're just puppy mills of dentists, but we're not. Um, I think that working with a place like Pacific Dental Services, they call it private practice plus for a reason because it feels like a private practice, but with the support of a corporation behind you that gives you all the marketing help that you need, all of the other things that no dentist wants to deal with in terms of the business and we get to focus on truly being the best in us that we can be. It's not pushy, um, at least not in the office that I work for. Thank God they are not pushing me to do things that I'm not comfortable with. I get to juristic my own treatment. Now, that is the con that you will hear about corporate in general, that they push you to make money. You're just a factory. Um, if you're not making money, you're, in dis you're disposable to them. I don't know about other places, obviously, because I've never worked at another place, but I have friends that work for other dental service organizations and they're happy to, I will say another good pro about working for a dental service organization is that you're going to have a constant flow of patients. Um, you will be doing a lot of procedures and seeing a lot more patients. There are some private practices that are like that, but all the private practices that I've shadowed with exception of one do not have the patient volume. And being an associate in a dental service organization is really great because you're all on the same rank. Um, they're not going to pick the cool procedures for the owner dentists to do. I've seen a lot of private practices that are not in dental service organizations where the dentist gets to do all of the sexy procedures, like all of the implants, all of the good things. And they just hand their associates the cleanings and the fillings. Um, I get to do all the same things. I get to choose what I want to do. It's based on my comfort level and there is no divvying up of patients like, Oh, will you have a molar? I know you have to give that to me. That doesn't exist in, um, in the pra uh, practice that I work for. I will say something that is very similar about either wherever you work is that it's going to completely depend on who you're surrounded by. And that's just no matter what fields. So my owner dentist is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful mentor and wonderful owner dentist. Not every Pacific Dental Services practice, I don't think is the same as that. I'm in a very nurturing environment and um, I'm very blessed, um, but there are some where it's not the same as that. So keep that in mind. And same goes for private practice. Not every private practice doctor um, that wants you as an associate is going to treat you with that respect <laughs> for sure. So it's all going to depend on your staff and your doctors and you have to create the culture for yourself. Okay. Okay. And then this is, this question is kind of going back to dental school. Um, what would you say was the hardest part of dental school at oh, USC? Um, so I'm not sure if this person is asking for a course in particular, but um, for me, what was the hardest part? is the acclimation periods. And I had two of them and I'm still going through it now, even adjusting to a new practice. So for me, change is hard. I embrace change, but it's very hard for me to deal with. And I get very stressed. So the first semester of dental school, miserable. I hated it. Even though the course load was easy for me, learning my hand skills was really hard. And I was just so hard on myself because I would see, I, I also was seated next to some really talented, some of the top people in my class, I think, okay, just to give you some perspective, one of my, okay. So the person that sat two seats away from me, was a lab technician for years. And now is a faculty at USC already that doesn't happen. So she's very talented. The person next to me was also one of the top people in our class and she's in dental anesthesiology. Then there's me. There's another guy that's also really good at everything. He was an engineer and he was just really smart. And he was also just naturally good at things. Person behind me is a prosthodontist resident. The other person is another prosthodontic resident. So I was just surrounded by people who are just amazing. 
And I was just not amazing in school when I first started. I didn't have those hand skills. Um, so that was very stressful seeing people produce these beautiful fillings. And I was like struggling. Um, so yeah, it was pretty hard. That was very hard for me. And then clinic too is really tough. You have to manage everything yourself. You have to be on top of your um, schedule. You have to manage what requirements you need. No one's really going to look out for you. Your group practice director will look out for you, but you have to really be on top of it. He can't put in the work for you. So that was very stressful for me too. So people, so some people are like, oh, pre-clinic was the worst um, for me. I think in my opinion, it's just the acclimation. So getting used to pre-clinic and getting used to clinic was the hardest. But once I got into the groove of things, I really enjoyed dental school. Okay. And then I think we have time for one more question. Um, and I know you earlier, you mentioned that you were good with the interviews. So do you have any like interview tips or how to stand out during your interview? Man, I'm also a very big talker <laughs> in case you can't tell. Um, so interviews did come a little bit naturally to me, but I think that the biggest thing is to practice for sure. Practice those answers. I would just look up common job interview questions and practice it over multiple times. Record yourself when you talk. I mean, if you're a talker like me, I definitely, even still to this day, one of the tools that we're using in private practice for me and my mentor, he has me record my exams just to like, see how I, um, how I explain things and how I talk through things just because I'm a talker. So I can chat, 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 chat. And I just to cut out the fluff. So it's this very helpful tool to practice those interview questions that are very common. Like, tell me about yourself or why do you want to be a dentist? Start practicing those things, have bullet points ready to go, but don't sound rehearsed. Always sound natural, but have those three bullet points that you want to tackle. And don't just rely on your resume. Don't say, Oh, as I mentioned on my resume, like try to find things that are outside of the box a little bit because they want to know more about you. They want to know you as a person. Um, so that would be the first thing that I would do and try not to overthink it. It's a conversation just like me talking to well, myself right now. Um, it's just a conversation. Don't overthink it. Don't let the fact that they're a dentist and they're determining your future intimidate you because that's not what it is. It's just a conversation and you're just as likely to get in as anybody else. Okay. Thank you so much, doctor. Those are all the questions we had and yeah, we really, really appreciate your time and all of your responses. Of course. My pleasure. Keep in touch everybody. Um, so this is my Instagram handle. I'm usually pretty active. I did take a break for a while. I was just getting overwhelmed, but I'm at Dr. Period Rita DDS on Instagram. And you can always email me, um, from there, but here's the email that is listed right there. So if you have any questions or you want to keep in touch, you need a pep talk. I got you. I'm here for you and I want to support you. So please, please, please keep in touch. I look forward to seeing all of your future endeavors, everybody. I'm so proud of you already.